127 is the text that I'll read once again for the message. Psalm 127, and I'll read the first five verses. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain, not build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gates. May we look to our Lord now, once again, in a word of prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love to us, mercy and grace, and watch care over us. I thank thee, our Father, for the day that you have provided and blessed us with. This is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, so thankful to be able to come to the house of the Lord. It is such a joy to be able to sing. It's such a joy to fellowship. And Father, it is a joy to be able to bring the Word of God. I ask, Father, that you be with me this morning as I servant. May you give me liberty and ability from on high to present thy word in truth and in love. I do pray for those that are sick, those that are weak, those that are hurting. We have been prayed, pray especially for Sister Joan this morning. And Father, we pray that you would just bless her. We thank you for her, as Brother Allen said, as her desire and want to come to the house of the Lord when knowing she was not feeling well and here she is. We are thankful for that, Lord. And I ask, Father, that you would just bless. May you give me the words to speak. May I preach them in truth and love. Forgive us of our sins and these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. Simply titling the message, Education Number Two. Education Number Two. Our text, again, teaches us that it is the Lord that built the house. The Lord gives the responsibility of raising the heritage of the Lord to the parents. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. Fathers and mothers, that God equips to be leaders of every area of your children's growth and education. We studied and we learned that as Christians, as God's children, one of our primary endeavors is discipleship. Yes, evangelism as we talked about, but we know people must hear the gospel, but then we have... What we are instructed to do in Matthew chapter 28, then to teach them all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you all the way, even to the end of the world. Amen. Most of the Bible is devoted to teaching. Most of the Bible is devoted to instructing us on how we, as God's children, are to live as children of God. The learning and then the passing it on, as we read in Jude verses 3 and 4, as we read in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, about that cloud of witness that has passed and that it is now our time for the next generation. The other thing that we covered last week is that we covered the dominant worldviews. The four dominant worldviews, and really there are the four dominant worldviews. I said the dominant views of education, but really these dominant worldviews are what shapes how we educate, right? So we talked about the humanist worldview, the Marxist or Lenin worldview, the third one, the capitalistic worldview, and then we closed with the Christian worldview of education. We then took our time and talked about the foundation of our Christian worldview for the remainder of the sermon, the teaching from Genesis and how Genesis establishes for each of us that is in here today, our biblical worldview. As a reminder, a minimum of 10,800 hours is being poured into our children from the age of kindergarten through 12. And they are pushing that humanist, Marxist agenda. That is the teaching that John Dewey came from, who is known as the father of modern education. If you were in school, you heard probably about John Dewey and the Dewey Decimal System, and that in itself is not inherently evil, right, to categorize books within a library and how to find them within a library, but John Dewey came from the Marxist-Socialist worldview. 
John Dewey, the father of, or what we call one of the fathers of modern education, was a socialist. So, beloved, I encourage us, if we are adopting the Christian worldview, and, and I say that those that are here, and maybe even those that are listening, uh, or may listen to this message, uh, is how we live our lives. You know, it shapes what church we go to. It, it, it shapes how we act at work. It shapes why we don't believe that sodomite marriage is acceptable, and why abortion is murder, and so on and so forth. That is based upon our Christian worldview that is based upon the Word of God. As I preached out last week, a worldview does not mold in a couple of months. Not the worldview that is being pushed in the education system. And same holds true for the Christian worldview. It is very difficult to do that within a couple of months. As we get started for today's message, I want to read a few quotes. First, we who are engaged in the sacred cause of education are entitled to look upon all parents as having given hostages to our cause. Horace Mann, who lived from 1796 into 1859, another father of the American public school system, what he is saying is that they are looking upon all parents. They are, in other words, in that quote, he's saying, we thank you parents for sending your children to us that we may mold them. Another quote, education is thus a most powerful ally of humanism. And every American school is a school of humanism. What can a, theist, a theistic Sunday school meeting for an hour once a week and teaching only a fraction of the children do to stem the tide of the fire day program of humanistic teaching? Charles F. Porter, who lived from 1885 to 1962, who was one of the first signers of the first humanist manifesto in America. If you don't think that these socialist, communist documents are in America, you are grossly mistaken. You are grossly mistaken. There are groups of people that gather together that have an agenda of making us a socialist country. Now, thankfully, there are groups of people that work against that. And they are very patient in their molding and making America a socialist place. As I mentioned, this porter lived from 1885 to 1962. That gets close to home. And basically mocked our hour spent in the house of the Lord. There are many many other quotes that come from the manifestos that are current documents within our country that are not read out loud, that are we wish were not read out loud even now. And I have a few more that this message, as this message goes on. The reality is that the public education system was not set up to honor God. But as I preached last week, it was set up and as confirmed from the fathers of the American school system with the humanist movement in mind. As I preach this message, I only have one part with basically two huge subtitles and then I will quickly go through number three and number four. I've got four bullet points. Two of them pretty major. The other two are also pretty major, but I'm going to try to get them in. So the entirety of the message today is the arguments against homeschooling. The arguments against homeschooling. Again, I wish to give you four of the predominant ones, though there are many more that get involved in this. Next week, the Lord willing, I will wrap up my series of messages here on education um, and with, with the uh, positiveness of the biblical Christian worldview in homeschooling.
But the arguments against homeschooling, there are primarily four predominant arguments against homeschooling. It would take me weeks to preach about each one. So I will give you this most common of the four, or I'll give you the most common of why parents are so against it. Now believe me, I have an answer to many more of these. And believe me, I've had to give an answer to all of these that I am about to mention, both to my own family, to co-workers, and to other pastors and children of God. Like we are to be ready to give an answer of why we believe that sodomite marriage is wrong and why we believe that God created the heaven and the earth, we must also be ready to give an answer to whatever position, if it's biblical, that we hold. Now as I teach this, please keep in mind that which we've already learned and what I've recapped in the introduction about the agenda of the public school. First and foremost, one of the greatest arguments that comes to pass is the question that is asked is what about being salt and light in the public school? Now beloved, the majority of Christians and even of church leaders promote the concept that if you're going to be an obedient Christian and fulfill the Great Commission, you need to have your children in the government public school system to be an evangelist. That they, we are, I'm often told, my children are to be salt and light in the public school. The logic that follows is this. The theory that goes is like this. It is that you have good children and that as good parents, you need to send your good children into schools to be a good influence on bad children. I wish to read to you two verses that I will use more than one time in this message that not only teaches that that logic does not work, but teaches from the Word of God the reverse to be true. Turn, if you will, to the book of Proverbs, chapter 13 and verse 20. Proverbs, chapter 13 and verse 20. And the Word of the Lord says this, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Now what does the Bible also say, this will come out later, about a child? The book of Proverbs teaches us what? That foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Foolishness is bound in a child. My children were foolish and they still do foolish things. I as a child of God, as an adult, do foolish things. But foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. And the Word of God says here, He that walk with the wise men shall be wise, but a company of fools shall be destroyed. Now you pair that with 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33. Be not deceived. Now you can, yeah, right, I've been using that verse a lot throughout all of these messages on the neglected doctrine. But listen, be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Now you've heard me say this analogy before, but good news, you get to hear me say it again. All right. I'm going to use this illustration because it's almost apple picking season. It's almost fall. I don't know about you all, I've got some leaves falling in my yard already. But let's say that I have a barrel of beautiful, shiny, red... No, <laughs> I have a barrel of rotting apples. I have a barrel where the apples are beginning to rot and the apples are beginning to decay. And I hold in my hand one good, shiny, delicious apple. Anyway... No, I didn't take a bite out of it. I just did that for dramatic effect. What happens when I take this good apple and I put it in the barrel of decaying apples? Did that good apple make the barrel of rotting apples good? No. 
On the contrary, because decay is already going on, and because fermentation is already going on in the barrel of decaying apples, in fact, the good apple does what? It decays quicker than it would have if left to, or not put in with the barrel, by itself. The already decaying, rotting fermentation of the bad apples in the barrel causes the one good apple to not only not remain good, but decay faster. Be not deceived, evil communication, communications corrupt good manners. Now that's true of all aspects of life, right? As adults, you cannot expect to go in the company of a bunch of bad apples as one good and expect you to change the barrel. That's why you need to surround yourself with wise men, as the Bible taught us in Proverbs, with those that are wise. Again, I referenced this already, but another problem with this mindset, again, is the very basic fact that I've already given you, but I'll read it to you from the Word of God. In Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 15, this is what happens, you know, I get a, get a little ahead of myself in the message, get excited about these things. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 15, and the Word of God directly says this. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Therefore, sitting in a peer group of children that are the same age, that's what a peer group is, the foolishness is already there. Now, along with that, so I'm, I'm still on the salt light argument, but then it takes a turn. All right, then it, it takes a turn, and then it actually turns back to the salt and light. So watch this. So as talking with people, and I've heard this so many times, I live in a good school district, and my kid's school is different. Now, what's really cool about this is that when I'm able and when I get to talk to people about this, if you were to put a survey out to parents, myself, anyone, and everyone, and you were to give them two questions, and you were to say, overall, how do you feel the public education system is doing for our children? Not, I mean, the huge percentage of this, and I have all the Barna facts, I have all the research facts, I'm just not boring you with all of that. The huge percentage is, is that 80% of parents would say that the public education system is failing our children. Second question on the same survey, same parents, how do you feel your child's school is doing? 80% of parents would say that their children's school is not the same, that their children's school is doing better. The two numbers don't match up. If you agree that the public school system is harming children across the nation, then that your school or child school, and again, I'm not I'm preaching generically here, is not any different. Many will tell me it is filled with Christian teachers and coaches, etc. And as I talk to people, they insist that these Christian teachers have a huge impact in the schools. Many times, often, I will be told leaning in prayers and Bible studies so much that their public school is just about a Christian school anyway. And by the way, Christian schools are also pretty dangerous. Allow me to digress for a moment. If you have not seen the movie God's Not Dead 2, I would encourage it, but I will also give you a synopsis. In the movie, God's Not Dead 2, it focuses upon a teacher in a high school AP public school history class. This model, this, this example that went to court, was based upon thousands of like cases across our nation. Within that classroom, she was teaching a lesson about peace and how in, historically, you can see that Gandhi was the first part of her lesson, promoted peace. The next historical figure reference that she gave was of Martin Luther King, how he spoke of peace. Now, in the class, there was a student that said, isn't that similar to the teachings that Jesus 
had in the Bible. The teacher, being a Christian who had not originally used the name of Jesus as part of the class, answered and said yes, and therefore ended up in court. Now, there's, I'm giving you a 30, well, almost a minute synopsis of a movie that is almost two hours. Educators, no matter what level they are at, have come from these men, the John Dewey and the one that I read earlier, I have his name here, Charles Porter and other fathers of American education who promote the humanist agenda. The advantage, if there is to be one, of having a Christian teacher in a public school setting is that your child undoubtedly, if anything, is not going to get cursed at and will almost probably always be greeted with a smile because that is an attribute of being a child of God. But be not deceived, they cannot teach creation or even say the name of Jesus. What you're getting, again, is a school full of Christians that probably, again, will not cuss at your teacher. Or at your children, excuse me. In the book, the other one that I'm using, and there's just so much here, Indoctrination, you will read testimonies of multiple teachers who went in with the purpose of being that salt and light, as uh, we talked about, that had to leave because it was so corrupt. I like what Israel Rain says when he's asked this salt and light question. When parents said that their children are at good schools. And I quote, If you are so convinced that your local school is so different and so Christian, then it definitely does not need your children. If you truly believe in sending your children to be missionaries in the darkest places, then you need to send your children to a Muslim school or have them join a street gang somewhere to lead the local drug lords to Christ. He then wrote that most parents are absolutely appalled at that suggestion and even angered more. Most will say back, but Islam is a false religion and that would be anti-scriptural to send our children to be indoctrinated into a false religion. Aha! Ding, ding. So then along those lines of exact rationale, yes, Islam is bad, and you wouldn't want to spend 10,800 hours having your children indoctrinated in the religion of Islam, but then uh, what is to be said about the indoctrination of humanism, evolution, LBGT propaganda, and socialism, all which are as equally poisonous and bad. And then one more from this argument, and I will move on. If, and again, the song line were a good theory, we would expect to see government schools and societies becoming increasingly Christian. Right? So, using the rationale, because again, there, it's only 15 to 20% of homeschoolers, right? And so we have this 80% of children... Uh, some from Christian homes that are sent to the public schools. Now, if the salt and light was to hold true, then we would be living in a much more Christian nation because they'd be coming out and promoting Christian values. Turn on the news, and we are as far from a Christian nation as we can be. So the, the salt and light theory just doesn't hold up. In every study imaginable, our culture is becoming increasingly more hostile to the things of the Lord. Increasingly more. That we're being targeted. That soon, I will be turning in my, well, I won't, but pastors will be asked to turn in their sermons to see if they're preaching things like this or against sodomy or preaching creation. Study after study shows us that. So, the argument is made that if Christian parents were then to have left that 10 to 20 percent in the public schools, it would be different. Okay, so what you're saying is that teaching children 
at home with the Christian worldview is so powerful that it could change the tide of the other 80%. Well, then we must be doing something right in the home. <laughs> right? And once again, teachers are extremely limited on what they can say or do. The second, I said I have four. That one was big. This one will be big. The last two will go pretty quick. The second biggest argument against homeschooling is what about socialization? I stand before you and I got to tell you, I got to be careful here. If there is one argument that burns me more than all the other, if there's one thing that's going to get my blood boiling, it's when somebody says and talks about socialization. So I'm going to do, I, I put it second because I didn't want to be overrun with emotion. And I want to preach it with the same cool level-headedness as I preach the first. Now, none of you have come and told me that, so I'm not yelling at you or anything like that, but this is a question that I probably get asked more than any of the other arguments, period. What about socialization? What about it? All right. Let me talk about it. By God's grace, I will do my best not to allow my emotions to rule here. Once again, I want to begin this section of socialization taken right out of the Communist Manifesto, which is what the fathers of education we're using when they set up our system. And I quote, Do you charge us with wanting to stop the exploration, that is, the development of children by their parents? To this crime, we plead guilty. But you will say we destroy the most hallowed of relation when we replace home education by social. The communists have not invented the in intervention of society in education. They do but seek to alter the character of that intervention and to rescue education from the influence of the middle class, that is parents. The Communist Manifesto says we need to get, out, get the children out of the home, out of the toolage of the parents, so that we may form them to our way. All right, I say that quote and I do this. There's another common myth that has permeated our society that says, my children, and they talk right to me, and I, I have defended this one multiple times, my children won't be properly socialized unless I allow them to spend enormous amounts of time around other children their own age. This belief, although commonly held as fact and often perceived as truth, is false. Peer group socialization corrupts good moral character. Turn back once again with me to 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Proverbs 13, 20, once again, Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 20, we've read it. I'd like to give it to you again. The word of the Lord says, He that walketh with the wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. And Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 7. And it says, Whoso keepeth the law is a wise son, but he that is a companion of righteous men shameth his father. As I talk about the, so, the, the beginning group or the beginningness of this socialization, I ask all of you a very real question, and I ask it this way. In what working environment, in what workplace environment, do you work with people that are all your age? I've never worked in one that is all my age group. I've got younger people working with me. I've got people in my age group, and I've got older people working with me. It's been that way everywhere that I've ever worked from the retail industry, to the restaurant industry, to the golf course industry, and to the logistics industry. What socialization are we really trying to teach? We're trying to teach our children that they're good to talk to children? Or do we want to teach them that there's more to life than their own peer group? Well, the countless times in the Word of God, do you see what a mob mentality can do? 
countless times you read in the Word of God and how they would go and they would try to turn the world upside down because they thought what? They thought Paul was preaching a heresy and the group of them got together and tried to banish Paul. A group of them got together. The peers got together. Right? The peer and that mob mentality is very dangerous. Now, I know children, both from all gamuts. My brother, who I've said this to him, and so I'm not ashamed to say this now. Uh, you know, when, and I went to public school all 12 of my years. Thank God for his grades. And I'll talk about that in my closing. Is a very quiet child. And, but what's funny is the instant that a homeschool child is quiet, Oh, you awful parent! It's because you do not let them go to school, and that's why they're quiet. If they really, <laughs> why are we attacked when the quiet, you know, or the backward public school child is not? I don't know. I don't know, but it happens all the time. Not for many of you, but it happens all the time. I can begin to list the hundreds of stories that are documented in courthouses across America of crimes that are committed by the influence of a child peer group. And sure, a lot of times in that one group you have that one child from that Christian home, that, that bright, shiny, red, delicious apple. What's he going to do? A lot of times he wants to be accepted within that group and oftentimes doesn't say anything at all. Peer groups can often be summarized like this. Whoever spends the most time with your child and affirms them the most for who they are, your child will then have, they will, that group will then have their allegiance, that child's allegiance and loyalty. Wouldn't you rather that be you? I know I would. We covered that we should be permeating our children's lives with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we as parents should have the most direct influence with that. Now the system is getting more and more clever, tearing families apart. After school activities, you know, and individual interests that do not involve the entire family. And yes, even Sunday schools and churches, tearing families apart. As I preach this, folks, I'm becoming more and more convinced that I may not be doing you all right by ripping your children away from you even for an hour. I'm preaching against all of this stuff, and then, and, then I, I, and then I'm endorsing as a pastor of the church, well, let me just pull them all together and put them in a peer group and let them be taught instead of being with their family. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. I, I mean, I'm, I'm starting to know pretty strongly how I feel about that, but our children are learning these habits every day. We should desire that the habits that they are forming are based on the Bible and not on the world. So as I begin to close this section, I want you to think of your family. And I want you to really do an honest assessment of the condition of families in America. And if you were to do an honest assessment of families in America, and I'm not just talking about families with children, just families in America, you know that they're falling apart. We see divorce and we see children rebelling. We see this all the time. So I challenge you to think differently. Instead of being involved in tons of activities that separate members or member of our family from the family unit, let us think about how we socialize and spend our time pleasing God in our activities together as a family. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31, it says, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. In the book of Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3 verses 23 through 25. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you, see, you serve the Lord Christ. For he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily unto the Lord. May we find our peace 
knowing that what we're doing is together for our God. Now the challenge is this, that if you truly submit yourselves to the time or to time with God and to truly follow the Lord in your socialization activities, it's going to be uncomfortable. As you will see that it will not allow much time for the foolishness and the laziness and much more time directed towards relational reconciliation and Godly service. May I propose a pattern that, a, that my family and I try to do, that we try to maintain, we don't always succeed. But as I give this formula, not formula, as I give this pattern, I say this. Remember that Satan wants to tear apart the family unit. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, seeketh whom he may devour. A God-fearing family is a powerful, powerful witness for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am one pastor to one church. We have many families represented here, and as you all serve Christ together, you are a powerful witness out there in this world. As other churches preach messages maybe similar to this to their congregations, and the devil is no dummy, and he wants to tear that family apart in all kinds of ways. So, in the book that I'm referencing, look for social activities in the family that are like this. Number one, pro-family. Choose an activity that strengthens the family. Look for something which everyone can participate. Number two, pro-spiritual. Look for activities that build your relationship with God and avoid activities that will tear down or undermine your faith. Number three, Look for activities or socialization events that are pro-educational. Choose something that will supplement your child's education and make it a learning experience. Number four, pro-relational. I am not up here advocating against friends and children having friends. If you think that's what I've been preaching, then, then I haven't done a good job in expressing my message. But when you are doing things together as a family, these positive socialization events provide an environment where people can learn from each other and share ideas. And what you're learning to do is to develop close friendships and not surface relationships. God, as I have preached multiple times, has made us relational people. He has. Let's build close relationships with those that are of like faith and like mine. You all know I'm a huge advocate of the family and the family doing things together. This, this, this doesn't happen, as I said, this doesn't happen every time in my own family, but it should be a goal that in our activities we are doing as many of them as often as we can together as a family or other church activities or Christian families together. As I said, I'm not saying that our children cannot or even should not have friends. Of course they should. I have close, dear friends. Of course, my closest friend is my wife. She's my closest. No one is closer. But let us be careful, knowing that our adversary, the devil, seeks to destroy this strong family unit. Much more can be said, but I have two more. Number three. The argument is, I'm not equipped, I'm not smart enough to teach my children. I want to take care of this one very quickly. In all levels of service, watch this, who does the equipping? God. I wasn't equipped to be a pastor. I wasn't equipped to be a preacher. I, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I didn't go to like nine years of Christian seminary. God equips when he calls. And, and we know that is true. In Exodus chapter 3, God called Moses. And Moses was like, no, -uh, no, no, me. Mm -mm, not going. <laughs> not going to do it. I don't know how to talk, and I don't know this, and I'm not loud enough, and they're not going to listen to me, and why would they listen to me? And finally God says, you tell them I am that I am, right? It is God that equipped Moses. And God took care of all of Moses' excuses, didn't he? He did. 
Because God called Moses and God gave Moses the ability. Jonah! Oh boy. Oh boy, I tell you what. God calls him to go to Nineveh. He's like, uh oh, mm -mm. they the Ninevites, I don't like them. You know, they're from Nineveh, and I, I'm not, and we, we don't like those folks, and I don't want to go over there. I'm not doing, mm -mm, not doing it. Mm -mm. God equipped him, didn't he? God equipped him, and, and, and what, did, what did he end up doing? He went and he ended up speaking. Paul had an infirmity in the flesh that he spoke about. He talked about his head, basically a, uh, being, being that, and God equipped him to be an incredible missionary. You see, God equips us to the level of service he calls us to, no matter what field of service that is. God equips us. Beloved, I encourage you and I implore you and I want to tell you that God will give you the tools you need to educate your own flesh and blood. Time and time again, the statistic after statistic has shown the children that come from that biblical home school score 80 in the 80th and 90th percentiles. Whether or not the mothers have a college degree or whether or not they even completed high school, God equips. You may not feel qualified, but it is God that does it. And then fourthly and finally, it costs too much. Now there are a plurality of others, and I'll close with this one, and I'll just do it quickly. Thank you for allowing me to go over. For the 2012-2013 school year, it cost the American taxpayer an average of $12,296 per year per child. And that does not include all the cost of new clothing, designer shoes, new book bag, new this and new that. Doesn't include that price. Just the amount of taxpayer dollars that went in. The average for most homeschoolers they spend less than $900, that's a far less cry than $12,000 per child and per year. But God has given us the ability to do this now for 15 years with our children, and it's a lot less than that for us. We get to use, reuse some books, and my children don't get new clothes on the first day of school. <laughs> when they grow out of clothes, they get new clothes, amen? That's <laughs> when they get them. But that's the other biggest argument that I hear. Beloved, as I close, next week we'll have more lessons about the benefits of homeschooling and how it relates to our biblical worldview and how we can incorporate the subjects of the Lord Jesus into our everyday lessons. And I want you to know as I close this message that I am not criticizing, I am not demoralizing. I came from the public school system, and I want to tell you God's grace is amazing. I just want my children to be better exposed to the things of God than I was. And I'm not saying that, if, again, any of us or and I went, you know, to that public school system that, that you are inferior or that we are superior. And any anybody that thinks that, their their heart's not in the right place with homeschooling anyway. But just to teach this perspective, if I don't teach it, God fearing pastors do not teach it. I, I don't know where else it would come from. I thank you for allowing me the privilege of teaching these lessons. One more next week, the Lord willing, and shall we stand together and we'll be dismissed in the word of prayer.